There she is. Hello. Um, <laughs> that was great. That was great. I knew you could do it. All of your fans in the comments knew you could do it. I mean, you just had to spend some extra time on that hair, right? That's what that whole ruse was. No, what I need to do is spend extra time <laughs> updating Instagram because, <laughs> which just goes to show you how how often I use Instagram is, uh, it's completely out of, how many, how many updates have I missed? I wonder a lot. I don't know. I thought it was I, so many that enough that it was telling me that you needed to update your phone and not you. <laughs> so I was, it literally popped up. It was like, Alaska needs to update her phone. I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> but here we are. I am so glad we got this figured out. Thank you so much for being here amid all of the preparation you're doing for Drag Queen of the Year. Uh, I'm assuming you and Lola have just been pouring those candles by hand when you're not in the forest picking flowers <laughs> for the winner's bouquet. That's what you've been doing this whole time, right? Basically, it is a ton of work, but I mean, you know, we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. still, <laughs> but really the contestants, they're the ones doing the really hard work. And girl, this show is gonna be just it's gonna be over. It's gonna be so good. Yes. If it is even half as good as your look right now, I mean, we are in for a huge treat. You look amazing. I love these earrings. The zebra, you're staying on theme with zebra. Um, <laughs> Everything must be zebra. It's pronounced zebra. Oh, zebra. I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but it is pronounced zebra. I'm prime for embarrassing. Embarrass me all you want. I just want to say, though, before we start, on a personal note, Alaska, I am broadcasting right now from Pittsburgh, where you became a local icon before becoming an international icon on Drag Race. And we do so much coverage of Drag Race here at EW, and I tell people all the time that the obsession of mine is all your faults because you were the very first drag show I ever went to at the Blue Moon in Lawrenceville. So you are responsible for all of the coverage that I do, truly. Do you remember what show it was? Yes, it was, you were wearing, um, you looked like a murdered cheerleader. You had like a crop top on and uh, your makeup was like smudged all over your face. You had a blonde wig that looked like it had dirt in it and stuff. My friend had an inflatable guitar that she kept holding up in the audience. <laughs> that was during my Christine era and I was mm -hmm. doing like really gross, gritty, dirty drag. And I remember that look and I think I had like, I, I had done some sort of video shoot where they had me like with um, jelly doing something with like jam. Yes. And so underneath all of my nails was like grape jelly. It was, it was disgusting. I have, there's a picture of you and I somewhere in the back room at Blue Moon uh, that is floating around somewhere. So I'm gonna have to find it uh, to confirm if there was in fact jelly underneath your fingers, but. Um... Must be jelly. <laughs> It was a very fond memory. And you know, Pittsburgh drag is excellent. We have to give credit in so many ways. Like until you have seen the moon baby stick a boiled egg up her butt on stage, you have not witnessed drag. That's all I'm just, I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, I'll have my eggs over easy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> much safer that way. Now, speaking of Pittsburgh excellence, Lola LaCroix, another fabulous queen who is really well known here, is your partner for the Drag Queen of the Year contest, which is coming up this weekend, March 7th, streaming on Sessions Live. You said you wanted to see what would happen if you included performers of all types uh, in one space with this pageant. Uh, from trans and non-binary to you also have burlesque performers doing this pageant. Uh, so after doing that with the first one, I'm curious how did you find that having all types of performers together in one space in a competition changed the dynamic of a competition? Well, to me, it really, it just, it was really like natural and it made sense because I don't know about like other drag queens, but I've always like, I've always shared a dressing room with, there's a drag king over there. This girl does burlesque. This girl's trans, but she does drag. I mean, it's like, this was, this is not like wacko in the culture of drag right. to see people who, who have a different drag perspective or like history. 
uh, working together. So to me, it was like very natural. And we were just sort of like, isn't it absurd that there are so many rules? It's like, it's like, okay, like you can't, okay, you have to be this and you have to be this and you have to be this or else you're not, unless it'll, it'll just ruin the whole competition. It's like, no, mm -hmm. the show, we, we did it. We mashed, we mashed all these different types of performers together on the same stage. The show was outstanding. And uh, I don't want to give anything away, but the show's going to be outstanding again. I mean, judging by the cast alone, the cast is incredible. You have eight performers. To quote you, they were chosen by a mysterious panel of anonymous drag elders. So yeah. was this like the Ouija board? Are, have these drag elders passed on to the afterlife? Like, who are these elders? Well, I don't know who the drag elders are by design. <laughs> uh, but if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. Oh. Lovely. Good to know. So it's just, a, I just wasted a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a waste. <laughs> Throw it out. <laughs> um, no, I mean, yes, 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 yes. So, I mean, I do love this cast, though. We have Chiquitita, who is just a Brooklyn legend. Love her so much. Lucy Stuhl, who was so involved in, in everything that was going on last year on the Chicago scene. Uh, so a lot of people have really been paying attention to her lately. Uh, lots of these contestants are really great on their own, but what statement do you think the cast makes as a whole about the drag industry, seeing them all together in one space? I mean, to me, it's like, it's about like inspiration. And it, <laughs> it's, it's especially inspiring to see the work that these performers are doing, especially considering the state of the world and the state of drag and the state of nightlife and entertainment this is, I, I mean, that it, that makes it so much even more inspiring. So like seeing what these performers are doing and pu pulling together and making happen, I mean, it's like, and that's really what it's about is like the gift of that inspiration is something that everyone who's seeing the page gets to, gets to enjoy and it reverberates out into the world. And that's really, I mean, that's what it's about for me is incredibly inspiring. Yeah, and this does, I mean, stand to be, I mean, the 2019 one, a lot of people were really, really into that. This one stands to be even bigger, but obviously the pandemic, like you said, affected how so many drag performers of all kinds were able to make a living last year. So this too will be adapted for the digital landscape. Um, but how will this year's pageant be different in that sense from the first one? Because I think you have pre-recorded segments plus you're broadcasting live from a studio, correct? Yes. So it's like going to be a combination of there's some pre-recorded stuff, but then some of the stuff we're doing completely live. Like mm -hmm. Lola and I will be in the studio in Los Angeles and we'll be piping in all the contestants from all over uh mm. live and we'll also have some pre-recorded stuff as well so okay so mm -hmm. we get the we get the best of both worlds <laughs> like hannah montana <laughs> um do, so what can we expect from the pre-recorded stuff is it going to be like digital drag performances or are the pre-recorded things i don't know you'll just have to tune in and find out <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get nowhere with that. A little tidbit, a little tidbit. Little, little bit? No? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's, well, it is pre-recorded elements, so it's really up to the contestants. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I mean, I will say it's like, they, re girl, they really stepped it, they stepped it up. Yeah. They, they stepped it up and they brought it. Mm -hmm. People are very, very excited to see that. And the guest judges are also amazing. Willem, of course, Shea Coulee, Peppermint, Vinegar Strokes, Jiggly, Nicole Byer, who was so incredible on Drag Race this season as a guest judge. This is a woman who loves herself some drag. We all love to see it. The fans really liked her as a judge on this season of Drag Race as well. And I think, I remember on Race Chaser, though, you and Willem, I think this might have been like two years ago, uh, you initially had like lightly questioned her podcast because she wasn't a queen, but was covering queens. So what has made you sort of come around on someone like Nicole and welcome her into the family as somebody who's going to be on the panel for a pageant like this? 
Well, she was on the she was on the panel of illustrious celebrity judges the first time around. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm grateful that she said yes to do it again because she found the experience a little harrowing. Only because the first year, we were doing it in a theater. It was our first time doing it. We ran out of time. So the first time we did the show was the first time the show was done. Yeah. There was no dress rehearsal. There was no time to run all the technical stuff. So we sat there in the dark for sometimes 20 minutes in between numbers as the stage got switched and this got moved over there and the props got put into place so that everyone was ready for their performance. And Nicole Byer, by halfway through, was just like, are we, are we, by hour <laughs> three, I mean, she had just had it. She was like, are we done with this yet? Like, what is going on? It's taking so long. That, so it was very nice of her to say yes to doing and judging the passion mm. again. And I assure you, viewers at home, because much of the show is coming from pre-recorded elements, and because sessions live are legit as f we won't have 20 minute wait times <laughs> in between the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but no, Nicole is- She'll be doing her home. What? She'll be doing this from the comfort of her home. So even if there is a delay, she'll be, she'll be good. She'll be comfortable, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> But I do think, you know, that is a, a conversation that a lot of people do have is that uh, people who are not drag queens critiquing something like Drag Race or the, the Drag Queen of the Year pageant. So um, was there something that sort of switched in your mind with Nicole before the first pageant? Um, you know, because you're having her on twice now. It, was there something that switched in your mind that said, okay, yeah, I, I'm gonna, she is right for this. She gets it. Like, is she secretly a drag queen who just really gets it? Well, well, I don't know what you mean. Something switched in my mind. When mm -hmm. did I? When was I coming for Nicole Byer? No, I don't think you were coming for her. But there was an episode of Race Chaser where you guys were saying that uh, when her podcast was initially announced, you were like, "Oh, well, you know, it's not dra a drag queen. She's not a drag queen going to be critiquing drag queens." So that's what I'm. What I'm <laughs> talking about. Well, that was us being shady, um, which. <laughs> I mean, tune into Race Chaser, Wednesdays and Fridays. It, it, we do that a lot. Um, we were being shady because there was another podcast talking about Drag Race. Mm -hmm. That's where I think that was coming from. I mean, is Nicole Byer uh, qualified <laughs> to speak on the treatises of drag? I would say yes. And if you need any you proof, it. you can even watch Drag Race because she was a guest judge mm -hmm. on this season. Yeah. And she was one of the, I, I literally think she should go in and be a regular recurring judge because she really has, she's so funny and she really gets it. And that, that's really what you need in someone judging, you know, Drag Race or a pageant. Exactly. Yes. No, I totally agree with you. I think she was great on Drag Race. I cannot wait to see what she's going to do on this. Um, she has, her critiques are they they don't come from a place of like oh like she's obviously making good tv but she is you can tell she's in it and she's paying attention and she's not just saying things just to say them for like crazy effects so i think she does yeah. get it um total and it's it's funny though because i get the sense that in the way that you know the nicole and these judges and the cast itself are so different from what we have seen before in a lot of mainstream competitions drag queen of the year does seem like maybe a way for you to carve a lane for yourself in this industry on your own terms. And I'd love to see you doing that. So how do you think that this pageant does that for you or, or maybe separates you from uh, the, the, the drag race association, I guess? Not that that's a bad thing, but I mean, you do seem to be carving a lane for yourself. Well, I mean, I don't really, I don't really see it as separating myself from drag race because that's not, I mean, drag race is a part of me and it's a part mm -hmm. of my soul and, you know, it's a part of my life for always. And yeah. that I'll always be really, really grateful about. Um, but I mean, it's, it's also like part of like loving drag is loving like drag that happens outside of drag race. So like in the first initial, but, but then again, because Drag Queen of the Year has no rules, I wouldn't mind seeing former Drag Race contestants compete. And when we first announced it, and 
And every time we open it to everyone. Have you never done drag before? Have you been on drag race? Are you, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I don't see it as separate, but I mean, drag is, drag on drag race is amazing. And it's one thing, but there, there is so much drag that happens outside of it that, you know, mm -hmm. let's put a spotlight on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a head judge, do you, <laughs> do you ever find yourself like maybe sometimes falling into ruisms or mannerisms <laughs> in the pageant or like fighting it back? Like, I, I can't approach this like group. I don't want to see any more <laughs> goddamn H&M ever. <laughs> no more H&M ever. <laughs> yes, no H&M at the Drag Queen of the Year pageant, none. No, no, I mean, girl, no, yeah. RuPaul is every woman. RuPaul is the, the Sphinx, the mm. statue. Uh, I don't, I mean, her job is sort of like being the Queen of England. And a lot of the times it's her job, the, the opinion of the Queen is that she does not have an opinion. And so she, a lot of the times, she says, Michelle, what do you think? Guest judge over here, what do you think? Hmm, very interesting. And she just keeps it to herself. But she is every woman and sometimes she's pushed to the brink and she just can't, she just can't help it. And she has to lay some down. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, do, I, yeah, yes, I, I consider myself a RuPaul impersonator. I, I steal from her at all times. Uh, as I think a lot of people should. Uh, so I support, I support that. I support yeah. stealing from the best. Mm -hmm. Yes, nobody better to steal from than Rue. Uh, <laughs> you know, here you are, I think, at the top of your game in so many ways. And it's interesting because I think I was worried about you after All Stars 2, I think, as a lot of people were because of some, you know, the, the backlash that you had gotten. And I'm glad to see you overcome that. But I just want to you know, sort of get into your mind about where you were at that point. Had you ever, had it ever gotten so bad that you had considered maybe walking away from the art form? Because we're seeing a lot of the queens, even on the current season, go through the same thing. And I just think it's important for people to always hear from your perspective how bad it can get in that sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, it never... It, it never really gets, like, I, if I, you know, I, I have, you know, hyperbolic moments where I'm like, that's it, I gotta quit, I gotta quit drag. This is it, this is the end of the world. But that's because I'm a Pisces and I'm very dramatic. But truthful, truthfully, the reality is I can't, I can't quit drag because mm -hmm. I don't know what I would do or where I would be or who I would be without it. So the truth of the matter is, in one form or another, it's it's drag all the way. Yeah. And it's yes, it's difficult sometimes. And of course, after All Stars, it was very, very difficult. But but even like then, it was never to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna retire. I just said, you know, people were calling me a snake ass. Mm -hmm. So I just wrote snake ass on a t shirt and sold it to them. That's all, that's all, mm -hmm. and, which I guess is just like taking that, you know, taking that horrible attention and twisting it around and, and, and stealing it and using it for, you know, using it as a good thing. So mm -hmm. like, that's what I recommend yeah. to anybody out there who's getting it hard mm -hmm. right now. I mean, some of the queens who are, like I said, are going through it right now, uh, Candy Muse, who was on a song with you, uh, sitting alone in the VIP, is getting it, I think, particularly bad right now. Um, so, Which I don't understand, because this, se because what would this season be like without Candy Muse? Like, come on, <laughs> she's, she's incredible. Crazy. She's I love her. Yes, she knows, and I love that it's like, Candy will be sitting there and somebody else will say something and she'll be like, oh, well, they're going to do that to this to you in the edit. And like, she knows the ins and outs of Drag Race. She knows exactly what she's doing. She makes great TV. But as somebody who's worked with her in the past, like, do you think, what do you think that the fans are getting wrong about Candy? Because everybody that I talk to is like, oh, Candy is so sweet. I love Candy. So, so what do you think the fans are getting wrong about Candy right now? 
Well, I think a lot of the fans are getting it right because they love her. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, but yes, there are some, you know, who just happen to be like loud. And it's like, yeah. that that isn't the predominant uh, uh, view of her at all. And it really isn't RuPaul's view of her. I mean, RuPaul did the candy, invented the candy muse save and said, candy, candy wait. I'm not ready to see you go. Oh, it was such a good moment. It was so good. So, like, really, I mean, in the scheme of the show, does it really, does it really matter what a few, like, annoying people online are saying? Uh, I think it matters more, like, what RuPaul is saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And Candy is a star. She's going to be a star long after she's on the show, so. Absolutely. I mean... Give her a producer credit. Give her a TV show of her own. Candy's world. I mean, come on. She needs when when season thirteen wins its Emmy. Uh, Candy should be the write-in for a producer uh, to win the Emmy Thank as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I want to also talk to you because this week they're doing obviously Snatch Game. Your Snatch Game is so iconic. Mae West is just one of the standards for the challenge, oh. and it looks like oh, I love it. I love it. Um, and it looks like more historical figures might be coming into play this week. It looks like from the preview, Simone is apparently doing Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there were some people that initially saw that and were like, oh, uh, this, how are we going to make this funny? But Simone is amazing. I have confidence in her. Um, but what's your philosophy, I guess, in dealing with humor like that, that does blur the line? Because you and Willem get into territory like this sometimes. Um, Abora, certainly uh, the winner of the first Drag Queen of the Year pageant, got into some heat for making a joke about something that would, some people didn't like. But do you have to be more sensitive in 2021? Like, what's your philosophy in, in approaching humor right now? Yes, you know, we do have to be more sensitive. And, and I, I never think that being more sensitive is going to be bad for the human race. Right. I think the more we're aware of what our words and what our actions might might be doing. And if we're able to communicate that to one another, that like that that hurts me. Then like what what is wrong with that? I I don't see it. I don't see anything wrong with that. Sensitivity yeah. is something that we need in the world more than ever. So like, so yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, comedy is different because comedy, you can kind of, you can kind of get a pass if it's really funny, but even that it's like, it should be funny, but you know, not, uh, not hurting anybody or making somebody mm -hmm. feel diminished. Never, mm -hmm. never, never. Yeah. And that's a big thing, I mean, especially in drag. Drag is such an ever-evolving art form as it is. So to even see, like, from the beginnings of something like Drag Race, when the industry really took off in the mainstream, how different queens have approached comedy even since in the past 10 years. It's like, it, it really is a, a, an ever-changing, fluid uh, thing. I'm just waiting for somebody to do Lil Pound Cake on Snatch Game. I mean, honestly, we, we need somebody to do that. And my editor here at EW, Jillian Cedarholm, who's in the comments, she's a big fan of yours, and she also loves Saturday Night Live. And she would kill me if I did not ask you, because she always talks about this. Was Lil Pound Cake inspired by Saturday Night Live? It wasn't inspired. It was stolen. <laughs> no, the... But I mean, the concept of the doll is completely different. Right, but right. the name, no, I mean, I was on Drag Race and I was like, no, I'm still, that's such a good name. It's so funny. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I stole it from SNL. <laughs> well, Jillian has a, uh, she actually has a little pound cake doll and it's in all of our work meetings. It's sitting on the desk or the bookcase behind her. It's always there. So you are an ever, always present in <laughs> the EW staffers minds. And, well, I um, thought you were going to say, Julie has some papers that she wants to send. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank God. Oh my God. <laughs> thank God. Can you imagine? Um, I've also been wanting to ask you, people have been begging to see you on The Masked Singer for a while. Um, would you do that? And if you did, would you do it in drag underneath the costume? Or would that present a lot of logistical challenges? Oh, yeah. If I was on that show, I'd get in drag underneath it every time. 
<laughs> last shit under a sweaty <laughs> I would just make sure whatever character I was had a lot of space inside. Mm -hmm. So so look out if I if I'm ever on the mass singer, look out for somebody with a lot of space <laughs> around their head. Because that's the only way I'd be able to do it. But but yes, when I get eliminated and I take that, or when I win and I take that wins. thing off and get the mask, the golden mask or whatever you win, I I want to be fully done. Mm. Well, so I, I think like I think on the mask singer they give them a second, they fix it with editing because some of those ladies. <laughs> take off the thing and then they're like oh, and just blown out like perfect hair it's like mm -hmm. you've been under that mask for fucking six hours no no mm -hmm. no well that i mean because i think that is a thing a lot of people are like they want to see somebody from drag race on there and it's like everybody's always like oh they're not going to do it with all that makeup on I mean, i'm like these girls are pros they know what they're doing they're not gonna just let the mask come off and it just be a disaster no um, mm. now uh, you know, Lil Pound Cake is so iconically funny. Your Snatch Game is so iconically funny. And in addition to Drag Queen of the Year, you also have your first comedy special coming up, I believe. What can you tease about that? Yeah, finally. We filmed it so long ago. We filmed it pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. like right before sh hit the fan. Yeah. And so it kept just getting on, it was put on hold and on hold. And then we were like, I don't know, like do the jokes make sense now that we're all at home and everything is on Zoom, like, and so we sort of, so we've gotten into a place where um, I'm really happy with it. I really love it. And we finally get to like release it in the world. I think April, right, in April? I think so. I Let's. I, I mean, know. Ken, if you're watching, text me. I don't <laughs> know. It's been like years, mm. but it's really fun. I tell some jokes. I sing some songs. Uh, it's it's very it's very nice. I like it. Can't wait to see that. You know, um, the last thing I want to ask you is, uh, what advice or or final words do you have for the uh, drag queen of the year content contestants before heading into the weekend? Oh my gosh. I mean, just just know that like, yes, we're only gonna be crowning one person as the winner. And by the way, the crown arrived today. F Fierce Drag Jewels, baby. <laughs> Fierce Drag Jewels also threw these in with the crown. And I'm like, can I'm you stop? <laughs> She's so good. The crown is so beautiful, but okay. So we're only crowning like one like winner, but mm -hmm. really like the things that I've seen uh, seen people do with with this platform and just this stage and this uh, this uh, like thing that we're doing this experiment. Uh, no matter what happens and no matter who wins, like everyone can take this and run with it, and and the inspiration that they're putting out there is gonna is going to. Uh, keep affecting people in positive ways. Yes, absolutely. I will be watching. I cannot wait to see it. Uh, do you want to tell people one last time where they can watch it and what day and time? It's on Sunday and we're doing it nice and early. We're doing it at 2 p.m. on the West Coast, 5 p.m. on the East Coast. So if you're in the UK or wherever, um, you know, it won't be like, two in the middle of the night <laughs> but you can go to the website um there's a link in my instagram bio and you can get a ticket no matter you can get a higher level ticket and we'll send you like a program and a candle and a, you know candle. gifts and shit. or mm. just buy a ticket and you get a link and you can watch and <laughs> watch along <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Oh, I saw somebody in the comments says I'm being shady. I'm not being shady. Am I being shady? Are you being shady, darling? Who's being shady? Yeah. Who? Uh, when? Somebody said I was being shady. Somebody said these questions are shady. How was I shady? These hoes <laughs> like to get it together. <laughs> I was not, if, if anything came, I was not intending to be coming up shady. I love you, Alaska. I would never want to come up shady to you. Um, but 
I mean, you heard it straight from Alaska's mouth this Sunday, uh, watch Drag Queen of the Year. And everybody, make sure to follow the contestants on their socials. We have links to all of their social media pages on EW.com in our article. So please click that. Thank you, Alaska, so much for being a lovely guest um, and for making all Pittsburghers proud. And I do want to say also thank you for, you and Willem shouted out um, mine and Jillian's podcast on Race Chaser last year. So that meant a lot to me that you guys actually shouted that out. So thank you for that. Thank you for everything that you do. It's always lovely to talk with you. Thank you. It was great talking to you too. See you thank Sunday. You. Yes. Bye everybody.